Okay, let, so let's um, continue with the last uh, lecture of uh, today, the second lecture of Professor Barrett. Okay, so thanks very much. So today I'm going to talk about the Dirac operator. Uh, last time I talked about non-commutativity in general and particularly explained how you can use the Laplace operator to encode the geometry of a space, the metric geometry. And this idea works still in the non-commutative case. And I explored some simple examples with matrices where this works out. Somewhat surprisingly, the, um, in the non-commutative case, there are two actions of the algebra. We had matrices and then the you can, you can multiply matrices on the left or on the right onto the matrices that form the Hilbert space, which is sort of the space of fields. Um, and this idea kind of works out, and I explained how the commutative limit works, and you get back to the commutative case where there's, in fact, only one algebra action. So uh, now I want to uh, discuss the more sophisticated Dirac operator and construct a, a framework framework, a mathematical framework called spectral triples in which a Dirac operator lives. And the spectral triples have the same structure. There's, there's uh, two actions of an algebra in the non-commutative case, one on the left and one on the right. Um, but in this case, there's more mathematical structure around, so it's actually a sort of better constructed scheme than, than just using the Laplace operator from before. Um, <coughs> And also, I mean, the Dirac operator is in a sense more primitive because you can always square a Dirac operator and you get some sort of a Laplacian. Uh, whereas, uh, so it sort of contains some theory of Laplacians, but it's more primitive because the Dirac is first order in, in, uh, on the manifold instead of second order. And the other point is that physics, you know, the standard model of particle physics is very much constructed with the Dirac operator. Uh, the, there isn't so much use for a Laplace operator in that, in that model. It's all about the Dirac operator. So we're also much closer to the physics. Okay, so where are my notes? Um, so there's various technical details which I'm going to rattle through and refer you to my notes for more information. And at some point I'll stop and do the exercises from last time. So, uh, so firstly, I want to talk about the Dirac operator on a manifold. It's a perfectly ordinary theory that you probably all know. But anyway, a recap here. M a manifold of dimension N with a metric G. And the cotangent bundle T apple star M um, contains one forms. Um, and then we have a spinner bundle. If you have a spin structure on this manifold, or a spin C structure, in fact, <clears throat> is a complex vector bundle. And the key piece of information is you have a, a Clifford multiplication. So Clifford multiplication. And this is a map cotangent bundle cross S to S. So it multiplies one forms on, it acts one forms onto the spinners. Um, and it acts point-wise. The, you know, the one forms at a point and the spinners at a point give you another spinner at the same point. Um, so <coughs> we use this to construct a, whoops, a Dirac operator. So um, So we have a covariant derivative on um, 
on sections of S. And you can just lift the Levi-Civita connection. Levi-Civita connection from the tangent bundle. Um, so, so this gives you a section of star M tensor S. And then, of course, you can use the Clifford multiplication to get you back to spinners. So the Dirac operator on a spinner field is the Clifford multiplication like this. So terribly abstract. Um, <clears throat> and um, in that generality, perhaps not very useful, but um, well, it is useful, but we're going to unpack it in a bit more detail in a minute. Okay, so, um, so the next topic is to talk about spinners. So again, this is probably stuff you know, and I'm going to summarize, and there's more detail in, in the notes. So we have um, a set of gamma matrices, which are uh, K by K matrices over C. So this is, so this is uh, a K dimensional vector space at each point. And um, <clears throat> so uh, with A equals 1 to N, and the standard equation for them matrix equation, which says that the um, if A and B are different, they um, anti-commute. So this is the Minkowski metric. This, this is diagonal, uh, whatever my conventions are. Sorry, not the uh, Euclidean metric. <laughs> well, whatever metric you have, but in, in the case that we're interested in, it's diagonal with ones in it. Um, well, it is, it is that. Um, <clears throat> so it tells you that uh, if A and B are uh, not equal, this is zero, then they anti-commute, and if A and B are equal, they square to minus one. Or if you have an indefinite signature here, possibly plus one. Okay. But I'm going to be interested in this lecture in the case, in the Euclidean case, so where all these are all ones, and so they all square to minus one. So this is Euclidean. In general, if this has um, um, which way around is it? Yes, if this has uh, Q ones and P minus ones on the diagonal, this is called type PQ. So in the Euclidean signature of interest, these are always type naught uh, N. Okay. All oh, right. Um, and you can always assume that these, um, the space in which it acts is irreducible. So we think, assume uh, CK, this K, CK is an irreducible representation 
of these gammas. In other words, you can't split it into a subspace on which the relations still hold, a non-trivial subspace. <clears throat> and then you find that K is, uh, what is it? It's 2 to the N over 2 if N is even, and 2 to the N minus 1 over 2 if N is odd. And in the even case, um, it's unique, up to the obvious equivalence. And in the odd case, there are two reps, two inequivalent representations. Okay, so that's all the standard stuff about, about gamma matrices. Um, we can also assume that the uh, here the gammas are, in this case, are uh, anti-homitian. And if they're squaring two to plus one, you could choose them to be homitian. So obviously that's not true in general. If you just pick some solutions to this equation, they won't be Hermitian or anti-Hermitian, but you can also choose that as well. Sort of standard stuff. Yeah, any questions so far? Have I got everybody on board? Okay, so there's a, an operator that comes for free called the chirality operator. And it just goes by the name of gamma with, with no indices. And it's the product of all of them. With a numerical factor in front, which is i to the power of can't remember, SS plus one, sorry, uh, yes, S, S plus one, where S is Q minus P. So in our Euclidean case, it's just the dimension. And then you can prove, and that's in fact an exercise, that uh, exercise six, uh, gamma squared is 1 for the identity matrix and is Hermitian. So what this means as a result is that the eigenvalues are plus or minus 1. So we call the plus 1 uh, eigenvalues left-handed spinners. and the minus one right-handed spinners. And this is the thing that in physics books is called gamma five for historical reasons. In actual fact, if you take four, the Euclidean case uh, in four dimensions, so there's four gamma matrices, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, gamma four, and you calculate this thing here and call it gamma five, then actually you have the right gamma matrices for five dimensions. And that's why it got called gamma five. So in the even case, if um, S is even, the gamma anti-commutes with the all the gamma matrices, the chirality anti-commutes the gamma matrices, and if S is odd, then it commutes with them. Which you prove by just commuting this with, with one gamma matrix and seeing what happens. In actual fact, in the, um, <clears throat> in the odd case, since this commutes with everything, then its eigenvalues classify the irreducible representations. 
and the eigenvalues of gamma um, can be these just classify the two, irredu two irreducible representations of the gamma matrices which I mentioned earlier. You can have uh, gamma being one or minus one times the identity operator in the irreducible. Okay. So that's a quick tour of gamma matrices. So now um, I want to write this Dirac operator in local form. Uh, so let's go to this board. Okay, so I'm going to take some uh, open subset um, on which you can trivialize everything. So, um, so then the spin bundle is that open subset cross a vector space. So V is that is what I called C to the K earlier. And I'm going to choose um, choose n vector fields. Um, uh, e1 to en. which are an orthonormal basis for my metric. So uh, this is a thing I called eta, but in the Euclidean case, this is just the Kronika delta. So an orthonormal basis. And then you have a dual basis of covectors. Roughly speaking, well, sections, the sections of the sections of the tangent cotangent bundle of U, I guess. Mm. Okay, and then the Clifford multiplication is um, is related to the gamma matrices. So the Clifford multiplication of this dual basis gadget with a spinner field is just the gamma matrix on the spinner field. So that's how, that's how the abstract formalism that I mentioned earlier connects with this charty formalism here in coordinates. Okay. Then you can um, write this formula here into sort of local form. By writing the unit matrix or unit operator at any point. Obviously summing over A here.
So therefore, the covariant derivative, you can write in the following suggestive way, that it's It's the covariant derivative in the e direction and then tensored with this one form here. So then, of course, this equation then becomes... Okay, if I just use this and then use the Clifford multiplication, you get the... sort of charty formula there. So I'm assuming this is all sort of recap for you all, but do stop me if anything isn't clear, please. So where am I going? Spinners, spinners. Then you can piece these charts together if uh, you and you primer both charts. Then you can have you know, a new frame field, some matrix. And of course, these coefficients depend on the point you're at. So, um, coefficients depending on x being in the rotation group, the n by n orthogonal matrices. Okay, so these are the transition functions in bundle language. And then in the spinner bundle, these transition functions um, are lifted to the appropriate spinner group. And this is um, perhaps not so well known, but the appropriate group is spin n. Uh, cross u1 over z2. Also known as the spin c group. How does this work? Well, as you know, you can lift uh, rotation matrices to spin matrices. So son lifts to spin n. So where does the U1 come in? Well, it comes into the fact that the, all the gamma matrices are complex matrices, and they commute with scalars. So you can always throw in an arbitrary scalar. Commutes. Gamma matrices, so gamma matrices. So the most general thing you can do is to lift the spinner bundle to this spin C bundle here. <coughs> okay. I'm sorry? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And in general, it doesn't. So, so if you have right. So let's sort of draw a picture here. You have u u prime. So for every pair, you've got to find um, uh, a lift. So you've got to find now functions on the overlap here, in um, in this group that map down to these things here. So there's obviously a map here where you. You, you forget this, and this maps down to there. Okay. 
And, and the U1 gives you some extra freedom here. Um, <clears throat> right. So that's the weakest thing you can do. Um, and then you can construct a spinner bundle and then this formula makes sense here. Um, just follow through, you know, the, because this you're used to and this commutes with everything and so on. And this, um, <clears throat> this lift here, uh, this always exists for uh, n greater uh, n less than or equal ugh, n less than or equal to four. Okay, if you go to five manifolds and so on, there may not even be a spin C structure. Okay, so that's sort of you know sketched the. The background to all this. I'm now going to state the theorem on this board. Or rather, so no. Uh, yeah. First is the definition. <laughs> then there's a the theorem. Yes. Yes. So if you have a spin bundle. That's a that gives you a spin C structure and vice versa. If you have a spin C structure, you can piece them together this way and make a spinner bundle. Yes. Thank you. I, I, mi I missed a bit of the story out. And this, that's lifted to that, which means that bundle S exists. Uh, by piecing together with these, with these uh, overlap functions. So, uh, so what's the definition? A spectral triple for a compact Riemannian Spin C manifold so spin C manifold just means there is a spinner bundle whose overlaps are patched together with functions like this or if you like it's a, a it's a it's a it's a reduction of the structure group of the tangent bundle to this in bizarre math speak um, a spectral triple is um, following data. The algebra is C infinity M. That's the smooth functions on manifold. The Hilbert space is the square inter integrable sections of S with uh, an inner product where you have a, a pointwise product of spinners using the standard inner product on CN. And the Riemannian volume and D is the Dirac operator. So that's, a, that's your first spectral triple, this data here. And the theorem that I mentioned slightly too quickly is that with this data you can reconstruct the manifold and its Riemannian metric. <clears throat> so theorem con D 
Let's do it. Let's do it. Determines uh, M and G up to up to the obvious up to isomorphism. Um, and then, um, so let's state this, this, this separately. Then you might ask, well, what data is this? You know, what, how do I characterize this data? So then there are axioms for this data. And I'm going to discuss some of them later, so I'm not going to say what they are now. But I'll just say, you know, there are some axioms which are due to Klon. And then there's uh, another theorem, which is that uh, any data satisfying the axioms Axioms is a is a uh, all this stuff compact Romanian uh, compact Romanian spin C manifold. So this is a sort of a, a, a generalization or a tightening, if you like, of the, the Gelfan representation theorem that says that if you have a C star algebra that corresponds to a topological space. So this is the analog here for Riemannian manifolds here. A much, much, you know, much tighter mathematical framework. There's more data to give and more constraints on it, but you get a much stronger result here. Okay, so that's um, that's about the Dirac operator. Any questions about this? Yeah. Yeah, frames and co-frames. Yeah, exactly. No, I'm going to talk about them later. Um, they fall into two um, sets, really. They're sort of algebraic axioms, which we're interested in. And there's some analytic axioms, like this is an operator and it has this certain domain and its growth of its eigenvalues is such and such. And we're not terribly interested in those. So I'm going to explain the axioms we're interested in and, and just waffle about the axioms we're not interested in. So part of the, um, the idea of this chapter, which I finished, was to explain how um, this basic idea of a spectral triple is to do with spin C manifolds. And spin C is sort of not very, very well known in physics circles. I mean, who cares about spin C, right? Um, we're more interested in spin manifolds. So one of the questions is, what's the extra data you need to make sure you have a spin manifold? Because that starts to look more like physics. And it turns out to be the tip of a rather large iceberg or something. And it's all about real structures. Um, so the next chapter is about real structures. Okay, so some point I want to do the exercises from last time. Should I do that now or a bit later? Or? Does anybody want me to do the exercises from last time?
If there's no requests, I, will, I could just leave it out. Well, let's carry on for a bit and see where we're up to. So now I want to talk about real structures. So a real structure on a Hilbert space is an operator um, such that, uh, which is anti-linear and it squares to uh, plus or minus one. So epsilon times the unit operator and epsilon is plus or minus one. And these sorts of things come up in all sorts of places. I mean, you might have seen them in, say, representations of Lie groups. We talk about a real representation, or possibly a quaternion representation. So these two cases, so j squared equals i, is called a real type. Ah. of real structure, and j squared equals minus one, minus i, is called the quaternionic type. Of real structure. <laughs> so confusingly, the real structure may or not be a real type. So if you have a group acting on a complex vector space, it may commute with such an antilinear operator. And then you talk about a real representation or quaternionic representation. So if we talk about algebras, <coughs> so a real algebra, so it's a vector space over R, But it can still act on a complex space. So, for example, um, you know, R acts on C. By, you know, X in R maps C to <laughs> XC, right? Yeah. And there's a real structure here, <coughs> which is complex conjugation. And that commutes with this action. So, you know, J of XC is X of JC. <laughs> this is real labored here. So, um, and in fact, you know, the R is the algebra of stuff that commutes with this J. So this real algebra is the algebra of operators on C, which commutes with the J. That's a way of sort of saying how this all fits together. And the, the other example of interest is the quaternions. And it's uh, real linear combinations of, um, well, uh, Q0, Q1, Q2, and Q3. Uh, Q0 
naught is the identity matrix. Q1 is, and these are the Pauli matrices. I think if I did it right. Or are they? No, they're I times the Pauli matrices. And the real structure that determines, so this is algebra generated over R. So all R linear combinations of these things here. And the real structure for this is, is the following. So obviously these act on C2, so this thing acts on C2 as well. So it does the SU2 thing like this. Okay, so this is antilinear on C2. And then H is the set of operators that commutes with J. So H commutes with J. And you'll notice here that J squared is minus one. So this is quaternionic type. So these are the basic algebras. And of course you can make matrices over these division rings here. Have matrices, real matrices, uh, yeah, matrices, real entries or matrices of quaternionic, quaternionic entries. And then these will have a real structure, it's either real or quaternionic. Okay. There. Uh, gamma matrices have real structures too. So we're starting to get warm. So gamma matrices have a real structure. Each set has one. So this is like this. I'm going to slow down a bit. So you might think at first that it should commute with the gamma matrices, but actually it turns out that it's advantageous to put a sign in. So epsilon prime is plus or minus one. So this is another sign that's different to this sign. And there's a table of signs you can write. So S. So the first thing is the sign epsilon is whether it's real or quaternionic. And the answer is, I ought to be able to write this without getting my notes, so I'll try. Like that. So this parameter S uh, I wrote before is Q minus P, but it's actually that mod eight, because the whole pattern repeats uh, every every time you go past eight, so you only need seven uh, eight entries here. So that's epsilon, and uh, epsilon prime is minus one for one and five, and plus one for all the others. Okay. And there's some more detail about this in my notes, which I'm going to sort of skip over. So, in uh, anyway, so in, in 
our case of interest, this number at the top here is just the dimension mod 8 of our manifold. And these are the gamma matrices. And you see that in dimensions 2, 3, 4, 5, they're the ternionic spinners. And in the other dimensions, they're real. This, uh, this minus 1 here is rather interesting. It says that um, actually this isn't a bona fide real structure because you'd have minus 1 in this case. And a way to understand it is that really it's borrowing the real structure from what happens if you put an I in front of all the gamma matrices. And then, because it's antilinear, this would then go to plus 1. So actually, this is sort of a fake real structure. And it comes from the other two cases that we really do have one, which is 3 and 7. So if you work out what the algebra generated by all the gamma matrices is, it's the following. They're matrices over, um, and again, I ought to know this. Now I'm going to cheat. make a mistake. Okay, you take all the gamma matrices, you multiply them, you're allowed to multiply them, take linear combinations. What algebra do you get? Well, it's an algebra of matrices over this, one of these division rings. And obviously the fact that you commute with a real structure means in all the bona fide cases, it has to be real or quaternionic, depending on the value of epsilon. And in the remaining two cases, there isn't an honest real structure that commutes with plus one, so they're actually the complex cases. But the algebra is the algebra of complex matrices. Okay. So this real structure is a big deal in mathematics. This eightfold way occurs in loads of different things in K theory, in group representations, in um, uh, various algebra classifications. Supersymmetric algebras and so on. So, um, yeah. Let's skip over the details. There's another um, sign you can calculate, which is going to be called epsilon double prime. And it's the following I can now work out what happens if I try and commute J with the chirality operator. And it's just a calculation to work out what, what epsilon double prime is, because the chirality operator is, is the product of gamma matrices, and you know how to commute J with the gamma matrix, and then there's some factor of I to some power. So there's a computation to work out the signs here. And, uh, right, so the interestingly, these are one, these are minus one, and these are all one. So I'll just check I've got that right. Yes, two and six, yeah. So that's, that's a sign that comes in into, um, a lot of different subjects. It will also come into our spectral triples. And it's exercise seven is to calculate this sign. Okay. So now I want to patch up the, the spin structures I talked about earlier. I talked about spin C structures. So what's the extra info you need to get a spin structure? I'm rubbing out exactly the thing I need. Ah. Okay, perhaps I'll leave that. Rub this out. So a spin structure
So the idea is we should add um, so we include um, a real structure in the spectral triple. Remember, in our example, this was the, the spinner, the L2 sections of the spinner bundle. So these are spinner fields, basically. Um, and you assume it acts locally. So in other words, at a point X, it's just, there's just some local operation on the spinners at a point. Okay, and this is, <coughs> this is the real structure for spinners, as we've discussed here, this one here. So this is real structure for spinners. And this is the real structure for the, for the fields. Okay, and the J have to glue together. correctly on overlaps. So here now my transition functions that were in the spin C group now have to commute with the J. Um, and so it turns out that spin N commutes with J. Because the spin group, remember, is generated by products of gamma matrices. These are the generators. So A not equal to B. These are the generators. Okay, so this generates the Lie algebra of this group. And uh, in all cases, um, J will commute with bilinear products. So the spin, so you're good for the spin, but the U1 doesn't. Okay, because J e to the i theta is e to the minus i theta. So you can't put the U1 factor in the transition functions if you want the J's to glue up. Okay, so the extra deal for having a spin manifold is that your spinner bundle has the real structure on it, which can be real type or quaternionic type. How am I doing for time? Well, this is uh, exactly 15 minutes. Okay, all right. So shall we have our five minute break? Right, and so, sorry, that's inverse. It's outside the brackets. So you have some matrix that commutes with any element of the algebra, any other n by n matrix, so it must be the multiple of the identity. Okay, that's the first part. Which one? That's that inverse. Yes, just one step inverse. Mm -hmm. And then that. One line Ah, oh, thank you, yes. Yes, thank you very much. So there's some algebra to do there, to get there. Okay, and then the point is that this is, you can show easily that this is positive. 
So my the V that I'm looking for is just U one over root lambda times and then that will be the identity on the nose. So it's really just an exercise in following through the definitions and so on. Where is exercise four? It's in this chapter somewhere. Okay, here we are, proving some relations. So we have to unpack what the definitions are. So, so I'm going to drop the index for the purposes of writing. So the V, the putative vector field, in the non-commutative case, is commuting with a matrix, and the R operator is anti-commuting. So V squared plus R squared acting on Psi, matrix Psi. Again, I have to multiply this all out. Okay, so the first one is v squared here, and then that one is r squared. And these obviously cancel here, just leaving me with the anti-commutator with x squared twice. And then the other one, uh, R, V, Psi. It's a similar sort of calculation. X squared Psi minus X Psi X plus X Psi X. So commutator with. So that's just the algebra. Yeah, any questions? Exercise five. This is the fun one. Uh, Calculate a commutator, well that's fairly boring, but let's do it. So it's, again, these definitions here. But for the three matrices for um, SU2, the three generators for the algebra in the as n by n matrices. So just write it all out. And then there's a bit of algebra to do. And eventually you end up with, oh, sorry, I, I need to write out the second line. Let's do that to make sure we get it right. Nice.
minus the same thing with 1 and 2 swapped. Minus, minus. Okay, and then these cancel here and these cancel, leaving you just the stuff on the outside. So this is But in this case of SU2 generators, X1, X2 is X3. Which is V3 in my notation. The sort of third vector field. Okay, now we get to the interesting bit. Explained by the little r's. So remember I rescaled the big r's to make the little r's. So little r... Let's write it here, little r i uh, l is big R l times i, the square root of minus 1, over n. So the commutator of the two little i's, uh, uh, r's, r1 and r2, is... Um, minus 1 over n squared times this commutator, which is v3, and that goes to 0. Okay. This converges, v3 converges. <laughs> to what I called actually v3 as the vector field on the manifold, as the rotation generator, it's a differential operator. But then if you divide by n squared, it converges to zero. So that explains why these coordinate functions in the limit become the, the commutative algebra of functions on the sphere. Okay. So, any question about these exercises? So my exercises are not hard, by the way, so please, please have a go at the next lot. Okay, so um, I want to talk about real spectral triples now. And I've warmed you up with um, a load of stuff about manifolds and real structures, but now I want to do the non-commutative case. So this is the payoff, if you like, of all that stuff we did before the break. So I'm going to give some axioms, and I have to emphasize these axioms have sort of developed over time. They're not, they weren't given once and then fixed. Some axioms have been dropped and others have been added in as, um, as the need arose. And in fact, originally the name spectral triple was the algebra of the Hilbert space and the Dirac operator, of course that had no real structure, and that eventually was discovered several decades later to be equivalent to spin C manifolds in the commutative case. And the real structure was added somewhat later. I mean, the spectral triples are from the 1980s. The real structure is 1995. Um, and uh, the application to the standard model was made in the 10 years that goes after that, up to the mid-2000s. So, and various axioms came and went along the way. Um, obviously, the real structure is an important thing that, that came in. Um, some axiom called Poincaré duality disappeared in, uh, in that time period because it wasn't compatible with the standard model and various other examples of interest. Um, and a few other axioms got modified. Um, but you can't sort of just change them arbitrarily. Well, you can, but, but you need a really good reason to change them. And so these reasons are sort of developed over time. And, um, 
any change you make has various consequences. And I hope that by explaining this through the sort of background, you might see what, what the point of the axioms is. Okay. So, real spectral triples. So real spectral triples got this data, S, A, H, D, J. So A, H, D you're familiar with, it's an algebra of the Hilbert space at Dirac operator. It can now be non-commutative. So it's a non possibly non-commutative star algebra. And the new things are S and J. So S is this is a, is a integer mod 8. And uh, J is the real structure, which I'll come to in a minute. So H is a Hilbert space. And as usual with a chirality operator. Chirality. It sort of goes with the Hilbert space. And um, this acts in H by bounded operators. Bounded operators. So as nice as you like. <clears throat> and I'm going to write the action by, uh, left room here, by LA. So uh, the action is L A. And it's a it's a as the notation suggests, it's a left action. So which is sort of the default. And obviously you want the star to be emission conjugation in the Hilbert space, so uh, L of A star is L A star. Okay, so the star in the algebra is just emission conjugation on the Hilbert space. Okay. Just a bit of warning, you often see in the literature that um, the same notation for A and LA. That, in other words, you, think, you can think of A as just an, an algebra of operators in Hilbert space, in which case you'd write this as A maps H to H. But actually that's going to be confusing um, because also I want to uh, think of algebras as matrices and I want to use that sort of notation for matrix multiplication, which is not necessarily what L of A means. Okay. And then there's a, a, an operator called the Dirac operator. Um, and it should be self adjoint. And uh, commutes are anti commutes with chirality in the even case and plus gamma d in the odd case. And in the odd case, um, um, it's often left out and because it commutes with it, you see, gamma commutes with everything. You see, um, the chirality operator yeah, commutes with the 
the action. And so in the odd case, the carality operator commutes with absolutely everything you have. And so you can actually just cut the Hilbert space in two and have the positive uh, eigenvalue, the plus one eigenvalue of eigenspace as a Hilbert subspace and the minus one as a Hilbert subspace. And they both describe spectral triples. So in a sense, having the two together is sort of... Uh, Makes it not, it makes it reducible. Into, it, yeah, so here's a way of saying it. In the odd case, you can reduce the, the Hilbert space into the sum of the two pieces. Uh, so people often sort of forget chirality in that case. Um, okay, and then we have the real structure. Uh, let's go over here. So this is an antilinear operator, and as you sh will be no surprise, its square is uh, plus or minus the identity operator, um, and it's unitary in this following sense that. And because it's antilinear, this has to be with a complex conjugation. So that means it's sort of unitary. Um, and the commutation with the Dirac operator is with the sign epsilon prime. So remember epsilon prime is plus or minus one. And then its commutation with the chirality operator is also plus or minus one. And these signs are the signs in this table here. And S is, is our parameter which I started with. So this parameter is often called the KO dimension. Which is its role in K-theory. It's, it's this similar thing happens in K-theory and that's, that's the mathematical name for it. Um, in the context of Clifford algebras, this was P minus Q mod 8, which is, if you like, the signature of the, of the manifold, the metric on the manifold. So, that's why I use the letter S. It's S for signature. Okay, so these signs here in this whole mod 8 periodicity story is exactly re reproduced here in the spectral triples. So now I've spent a lecture talking to you about Clifford algebras. It's now not surprising to see the same structures coming, coming here. So we haven't finished yet with the axioms um, because there's a kind of surprise baked into what I've said already. So there's a second action. So, which I'm going to call RA for R for right action. It's J L A. It's 
star j inverse. So I just want to dwell on this formula a little bit here. Um, the star is an anti-homomorphism. It, it flips, remember, a b star is b star a star. Um, so you have right away that r a b is r b r a. So that's what we mean to have a right action. And star is antilinear, but then so is j antilinear. So the combination of doing both is to make it linear again. So this is a, a linear operator. So we're in this situation where we've got two actions of the algebra on Hilbert space, um, a left and a right. And then you might ask, well, what do you make of this? What do you do with it? So, so there's, there's two cases. So now we split into two possible cases. And first is the commutative case. And here, the simplest thing to do, and we're going to do it, is to say that the two actions are equal. Uh, LA equals RA. So if you like, it's just a restriction on the left action and the J. And it says basically that J acts locally. That um, if, well, if you're on a manifold, e.g., a manifold, then star is complex conjugation at a point, and then this just tells you that J acts at a point. So it just says J acts at a point. So, um, which is what we assume, that J just acts on each spinner space at each point. It doesn't t pick up a spinner and take it to some different place, uh, which would poss be possible if you violated that axiom. So that's the sort of commutative case. Um, and in this, this commutative case, um, let's continue with this. We want to say, well, how does this action here, uh, LA, how does it play with the Dirac operator? And you have this axiom here. This axiom. If you take a commutator of D with LA, and then commute again with LB for some other algebra element, you get zero. And this is called the first order condition, or first order axiom. And what it tells you is that basically if you have a manifold, it tells you that this D is a first order operator. So on, on a manifold M, remember D is... is uh, it's got some derivatives. Like this. And so the first commutator here. Well, if L of A is just some function. Well, yeah, let's carry on. Yeah, right. It just says that that is the gradient of this function.
Okay, this is just some function on the manifold. And this thing here is a zeroth order operator. It is now acting on spinner fields. There's no derivatives left. This is just some function here. This vector field has eaten this function here to give you another function. Um, and so it just acts pointwise on, on the spinner bundle. And so you commute with any other function here. So um, commutes with uh, LB. So this, uh, this axiom is essentially telling you that D is a, a first order differential operator. In other words, this thing is a zeroth order operator. Okay. So you can take this as a, a general axiom that you know, even if you're not looking at a manifold, you look at something else and it's commutative, that's fine. So then you might ask, well, um, what are the other axioms? And this is, somebody asked me, are you going to say what the axioms are? Well, well, I've told you quite a lot of the axioms in the commutative case. There's a few more to go, which um, are aimed at characterizing a manifold, a smooth manifold with a particular dimension. And I'm not going to say what they are here. There's some description of them in my notes. Uh, so if you want to read that, please do. But let me say the remaining axioms are sort of an analytic character that they to do with coping with the unbounded operators and domains of definition and so on. Um, so they're very specific to the commutative case and the manifold case. And when we come to... Um, uh, finite dimensional things and matrices, we don't care about any analytic things. All operators have all defined on every domain, and so it doesn't matter. So a lot of these axioms are actually vacuous in the matrix case. Okay, so now I want to talk about the non-commutative case. Let's go here. Keeping my table up there in case I need it. Perhaps I don't anymore. So non-commutative axioms. So now instead of this, what do we do in to replace it? Well, this axiom is no good because I can't, in the non-commutative case, I can't say that a left action is equal to a right action because that would say that this product is the same as the other way around, which would force it to be commutative. So we, what we have to do is to have something weaker, which is that, um, which is just that these two actions commute. So the axioms are all the stuff I said before that I drew this line, all the stuff, all the previous stuff. But now instead of this, I'm going to say that the two actions commute. So this is what's technically called a bimodule. So we say that the Hilbert space is a bimodule over the algebra. It's just a fancy way of saying these two things commute. And the other thing you want to do is provide a replacement for this axiom here. And I need to explain why you can't just write this and that's no good in the non-commutative case. So if you write the, the Jacobi identity for double commutators, you, write, you would write the following thing.
So that's the Jacobi identity just written out with the right number of brackets. So this is what appears in the in the axiom. So this would be zero if I if I apply the commutative axiom, and this is the same thing but just rearranged. So this would be zero. But it would tell me that therefore the Dirac commutes with all commutators. And that's way too strong. If your algebra is really non-commutative, I mean just think of all the n by n matrices, that's the commutators is almost everything. So let's say a Dirac operator is more or less trivial. So you can't have this axiom, it's too strong. Um, so in the non-commutative case, uh, we change this. Uh, so this is bad, yeah. So the non-commutative axiom is the commutator with the left action, which is our kind of our sort of non-commutative version of a of a one form um, contracted with the Clifford multiplication with the gamma matrices. Um, that thing should commute with the right action. This is for all A and B in the algebra. And that turns out to be the right generalization of, of, of the, this uh, first order condition. So this is sort of the non-commutative first, this is still called the first order condition. But in the non-commutative version. And obviously if L and R are equal, then it just reduces to this thing here. So you can think of the commutative as a special case, if you like. Okay. Right, so I've got to the end of what I want to say this time. And it is late, so I guess everybody wants to go and have dinner. Are there any final questions? Can you maybe explain uh, the third line in the table to do that? This line here? Yes. Right, so you, we've got the gamma is So you do a computation, you just, you just plug this in here and here and commute the J past it and work out all the signs and add them up. Yeah, yeah, any other question? Okay, so um, that's the end of the sort of the the abstract nonsense and the general formalism. What I want to do in the next time is apply this to the internal space of the standard model and explain what this structure has to do with particle physics. Okay, so thank you everybody.